He's a man that leads by example. And he leads with wisdom. He's a very unassuming man, but a very powerful man. What he did was a father who loved and a father who showed. And there were individuals that were skeptics, there were those that doubted, but even though we could not see what he saw, we followed the vision of him. He's one of a kind. I don't know that there is or could ever be another Bishop Jackson, a man that has gone from driving an oil truck to becoming the vice presider of our national movement and also to becoming, uh, to receiving the order of the Palmetto, which is the highest order that one could receive in this state, or to be to being inducted into the Constitutional Hall of Fame. It, I have watched all of that and it has just amazed me as, how, as to how God led him into these avenues. And I remember him saying uh, on one time, whatever, God, whatever door God opens, I'm going to walk in. If God opens the door, A.C. Jackson is going to walk through it. I guess the Baptist Church has always been my life. I can't hardly ever remember when I was, when there was not a church involved in our life. My, my participation was that I grew up in the, to the Baptist Church and did what other young kids do. We started a, a small child with little quartets, and you know what kind of quartet that was, <laughs> if they had me on it. And also, as I grew older, I became president of the BYPU, that's the Young People's Union of the Baptist Church, began to study and learn no more. After my wife and I was married and went into New Jersey and came back, and then we, I went back into the church, what I did what other young boys do at around the teenagers, drift out of church, and when we came back, we became back to the Baptist Church. And, became, and during that time, uh, after my wife and I was married, and uh, I went to the church that uh, your mother, Mother Lord, was going to, which Mother Simmons then uh, was the missionary in charge of, was the pastor of the Pentecostal church. And I met Mother Simmons during that time. So one day Mother Simmons and I went down to a revival meeting down in, uh, in Hopkins. I think her name was Mother Hayes there. Yeah. And uh, she was in the pulpit, and she looked down on the seat where I was sitting, and just said, young man, you know, the Lord tell me to tell you, said, why you continue to fight what he's been asking you to do? What he's been asking me to do is to go on and minister. But you know, that's a hard job, coming into a neighborhood that you were raised in every, around, and you were raised everything but into the ministry. And, and so she asked me, so we started going around the neighborhood where I was raised, having street meetings on the street. My friends used to group up in little groups and they laughed and called me deacon and preacher because here I am sitting down with these missionaries, the young guy that just came out of the streets. And then the God had just directed me that I need to take my whole life and my whole Sunday school teaching ability and apply that to the ministry. And that's when I told Mother Simmons, I felt like God wanted me to go into the ministry. She told me she knew that all along. I got to know him when he, when he told me of his dreams and the things he would like to do. And at that time, we were talking about a deacon. I mean, he's, he hasn't yet taken on the eldership. But as he grew into that, uh, he, he, he committed himself to the organization. He worked under former Bishop Brown. Uh, who uh, was ordained out of Washington and was given this, uh, this diocese. And he worked faithfully. He had a small congregation that constantly grew uh, to the point where uh, he had uh, a, a minimal impact on, uh, on the organization, but he was a strong leader in the diocese. But then at a given time, he was led to move into Arthurtown, I think they called it and uh, with uh, Mother Simmons, and they started the church. And of course, uh, I, later on I understood it was a fire. And I remember as a, as a young child, us 
uh, standing on the side of the highway watching the fire destroy the church. And I can also remember Bishop Jackson. Even though he was sad, he seemed hopeful because it seemed like he knew something we didn't know. So right out there on the street while the church was burning, I was able to tell the congregation, we missed church this morning, but we will be in church that afternoon. We'll be into the house of Mother Simmons. And we did miss that Sunday morning before the fire, but that Sunday afternoon, we'd move down into Mother Simmons' house and head to service in two rooms. As I, as I look back on that, I would imagine that he was praying to God and saying, Lord, I know that you have something better. I'm very grateful to God to have a friend like him, and notwithstanding that a good man has to have a good woman by his side. And his lovely wife, uh, Mother Janie Jackson, who was a good friend of my wife and I, uh, is a powerful woman in her ability to keep him uh, comfortable and able to go through the things he's gone through. In uh, A.C.'s life, uh, God is first and foremost in his life, but second to God is his family. He loves his family, nothing comes before them. We have five children, and uh, he's taught our children from infancy to reverence and respect God. He's been a role model to all of our children, from Daryl through Mac. Daryl is the oldest, Mac is the youngest, and even the girls, uh, he's been a role model to them. As I said, his integrity has been unquestionable. There's no doubt about it. Uh, he has set a perfect, perfect example for them, not just in the home, but in the church also. And so what he did was a father who loved and a father who showed. He wasn't always there because he was so busy. I used to see him give his life to the church. He would wake up on Saturday mornings and go all day visiting people that were sick. And I used to wonder, when is he going to have time for us? But I guess what I realized was that he was really paving the road so that we can come after him and even do greater things. Now, as a mentor, he was second to none. As a pastor, and I tell people, what he showed me was how to be a man. And what he showed me more than anything else was, if you're confident and humble, you can achieve anything in life you want to do. You can just be amazed at the impact that he's had on men and women. I don't know how many, 20, 30, or even more, that are ministers now. And then uh, the bishops that have come through this particular diocese. So he is not just a builder of buildings, but he's a builder of men. And that is what uh, establishes a lasting legacy for us. When our lives touch other people's lives, and then they touch other folks' lives. He's always an example of what a man should be. And when a, a younger man can look at an older man and receive advice and direction in your life, that's a blessed thing. This diocese has seen a man who, I guess, went to the dirt roads and the back roads, places where other people may not have even gone or cared to go. And he preached in these places and he took meetings to these places. I can remember when uh, a caravan of us would be on, on the road going to some little dark corner where we would sometimes have the cars bogged down if it rained and uh, we would get muddy on the way to the church. But he was the one who, who stayed there and helped to develop these areas. Since the day I first met him, came into the ministry, I saw him sitting at his desk and he presented himself to me as a pastor not knowing him prior as a pastor that had a heart for people you know i, I have an old saying i like to say when people want to know what they're going to do this is what i'm going to do i told them one thing you got to do is walk through a door that god opened you don't have to kick any of them down you go to the door god opened and walk through it that's what we did it seemed like when a door needed to be opened Sometimes it seems impossible, but it's open, but if God said walk through it, walk through it. And I vividly remember the day that we marched from the school across the street to the church here on Atlas Road. I can remember that the choir was 
clothed in their robes and there were many many people from other churches here and I can remember how proud we were and reflecting back from whence we had come with the little red church with holes in the walls and holes in the ceiling and holes in the floor and the pot belly stove and then moving into an edifice that was brand new and just so beautiful it was a great great feeling well then then I began to the vision of not just the church building, to have church begin to focus in my mind, then the building of building lives, helping young people, but my children growing up, and things that were not here that we didn't have. See, we came down here when there was not a man of recreational facilities, was nothing down here for the young children to do. Everything they did, they did in the backyard or played in the street. We need to build a place for young people to have something. So that's when we started that building next door that we used now for a cafeteria. We called it a youth center. I think the Lord had laid it on my heart then. We need to be thinking about something that our young kids can do where they don't have to do. They were not fortunate enough to go across town to gyms like other kids do. And Bluff Park was not built. And we had nothing for them to do. So we decided that we, we, we would build what you call the Bible Way Church of Adventist Road Youth Center. I see him very much as a visionary, and I see him uh, very much as a builder. Uh, just touching back again uh, from the visionary standpoint, uh, things that they did, things that he was talking about doing, others had not even attempted to do, especially from a black perspective, you know, with the, um, with the Family Life Center and looking at the holistic aspect of man uh, with uh, the programs to feed the sick and to clothe the naked and the, the, nine, the nine point, I think, social programs that were established here. Those things were fine, but a lot of churches have emulated some of the things that he saw were necessary and he saw that we could do as a church. Spiritually, the man showed South Carolina that he was indeed a solid spiritual leader. He was a man of love for the diocese, and, and no miles got too long that Bishop uh, Jackson could not travel. He was always there to support the pastors and the congregation uh, day or night. Uh, his most concern was the churches in the diocese. He never was selfish. He didn't believe in just getting things for AC. What he had, God gave it to him. You know, God was there to provide the things that he needed. And I'm talking about when you had little children. You know, so South Carolina has seen tremendous spiritual leadership. Uh, South Carolina has seen uh, leadership from the standpoint of his, his social and political base. Uh, because he, he got out there and became one of the leaders in the areas of, of, of working with schools and things when, when they were integrating schools. He was one of the persons who was very instrumental in that, dealing with that issue. Uh, when it came to dealing with people's needs, social action was there. The whole diocese could see his leadership in the, from the standpoint of developing a social action program. Not only that, but he took the, uh, the diocese and moved to the point where we were involved in Africa. And we, would, uh, we had a one-for-one a -one program that we developed here. And it m met the needs of persons in Africa and tried to reach out there. And these are the kinds of things that he did. He, he placed us in a very strategic position when it came down to looking at what the state of South Carolina could do. He's a great leader. Uh, by his examples, he leads. And you can't help but to follow uh, a man of his caliber. He's a very unassuming man, but a very powerful man because when he started stuttering, you, you better know he means what he said. <laughs> and it was good like that. I enjoyed him to that extent. My heart was in more tune for what the community need, what the people need, what the children need. And I just felt that the Lord told me that we were going to have to build a larger sanctuary because there were so many people coming in that wanted to be into the church, into the church services. And the first thing was ask me, and I can understand, well, where are we going to get the money from? And where, where it's coming from? We did some daring things, of course. We did what every small church was doing at that time. They went to selling things and uh, had different kind of affairs. But the Lord 
remember once the Lord told me one of the daring things that everyone that loved the Lord that was in the church, remember, believed in the Lord, that the Lord asked if they would take their whole week's pay. It takes some nerve to ask someone that. And sign your check and give it to the Lord. You can imagine. And then not only was that rough on them here, that made it rough on everyone around. But everything we did, we kept books. It was available for everything we took in. But for me, we asked people that they got that to bring a week's pay and give it here that we might be able to build a church. And, but that's one of the things I can thank the Lord for. The Lord gave us someone that had confidence in me. When I asked, I, I'll tell them my week's pay would be only after they paid me. And my whole pay certainly would go. So the only thing they would leave, we were raising money with tithes and offering. The only thing they, they would do is give me mine that's coming so I could give mine. We didn't very often go out to eat because we just didn't have the funds. And there were five children. And I remember one Saturday, we had been promised earlier that week, I think it was report card week, if you do good, we'll take you out. And there was this place called Jeans Pick and Chicks. There was no McDonald's at the time. So we went there, and there was the drive-through window in which they would come and bring you food to the car. And I remember sitting there, and before they would order, mom and dad would pull out all of their money, and they would count it. We would be so anxious. We want this, we want that. And they would just count all of their money. And so they promised us that we would get a hamburger and french fries. Uh, but the kids decided we wanted a milkshake. We, we got to have a milkshake. I mean, we m may have gone out twice a year, if, if that. We wanted a milkshake. We sit in the car, dad looked at mom, mom looked at dad, and they says, okay, we'll get him a milkshake. When they ordered the milkshake, we were all in the back eating. I was the oldest, and I noticed that my dad and mom were not eating. They just weren't eating. And I just said to them, I says, well, aren't y'all gonna going to eat? And then mom looked at dad and she says, no, we really aren't that hungry. And I remember all of us were to eat and they had already decided that they were going to order. And it really didn't dawn on me until we pulled off and left. And then dad said to mom, uh, are there some leftovers at home that we can get some of that? And being the oldest, you know, it then clicked that they didn't eat because they wanted us to have that milkshake. And five milkshakes was pretty expensive. Five milkshakes took away two meals that the two of them could have had. And uh, I will always remember that. And I tell that to my, si my sons because, you know, what it showed me was the selflessness about them that uh, they would be willing to just give the ultimate so that we could be happy. And I would always cherish it. But you have to be honest. And you know that God be and we've always said, no matter what we have done, our books were open to every member in the church. And they knew what we was going to do. So that, that is how we started uh, with enough money to pray start this church that we're sitting in now. We did it by sacrificing everything we had. We had a mind to do it. And we kept doing something. <laughs> kept working every day. We didn't had no special mind. We just want to establish a way for God. And I can see it personally, I will have a living epistle. And I can stand before a congregation and openly and confident, with great confidence, use him and speak of him as a pastor of example in the same reference I do as a Peter or Paul. And I think that is, I don't know, that's made an impression on me that when I can refer to a leader nowadays and look at him in the same comparison as a leader during the days of the scriptures being written as the Peter and the Paul, I think uh, that has made a, such an impression upon my life. And I'm not ashamed to even discuss that or share that with the congregation. But I remember him saying, Dara, it's time for me to give it up. And I said, well, what do you mean? Because I was co-pastor and I said, no, I will remain co-pastor until the end. 
and says, you don't have to do this. I mean, I do all the work. I will, I will take care of all the administration of the church, uh, but I will remain co-pastor. And this was one of the uh, days that he wasn't feeling well and he was kind of sickly. And he says, no, he says, it's not for me and it's not for you, but it's for the work of the ministry. He said, this is bigger than me and it's bigger than you. It's for the work of the ministry. He says, if it's not you, it's going to be somebody else because the ministry is more important than all of us. I use a term quite often, don't get greedy. Greed is one of the worst things that can happen to us. God has us in this Christian journey as a relay race. There comes a time when the torch has to be passed. Whether you like it or not, you can keep it until you drop. But then nothing goes any further once you drop with it in your hand. But if it's going to go on, when you pass it, when you should, and you should be ready to pass it when there's some declining coming in. No one knows that any better than you do. I hope if they've learned anything from me, that they have learned the fall is coming. We're at the point now you talked about my life. I would say like you, the Bible talks about a leaf on the tree. It grows up and then it gets brown in late in the year. Then after a while, in the winter time, the leaves just slowly fall away. Well, that is, I don't want to go, but I know I've got to go. But I plead, I pray that if the Lord does take me, that he take me as a leaf on a tree. And my day come and just let me softly fall away. I don't have to struggle trying to hold on to the tree. I'm grateful. But there's some joy here that I hope every father, every leader would have an opportunity to, to do. To look at some of you young men to see the great job that you're doing. I think one thing, and I don't think that you would ever know, how much we learn from y'all. How much I've learned. I've learned, I ask Lord, Lord, I seem to think sometime now, I learned more from my son than he learned from me. Uh, oh, I don't mind being able to take in something that's coming in. We were getting ready for Easter Sunday service and we were at the township auditorium in the back office. This was the Tuesday before he went to the hospital. He was feeling kind of sick. And he called me and my cousin Chip and we were standing there. He said, I'm gonna tell you guys something. When I go, he said, cause I will go. He says, don't mourn long for me. And he said, do not stop doing what you're doing now. He said, because if you cease doing anything you're doing now because you're hurt and mourning for me, he said, that would be an insult to everything I worked for. And it has just amazed me as, how, as to how God led him into these avenues. And I remember him saying uh, on one time, whatever, God, whatever door God opens, I'm going to walk in. If God opens the door, A.C. Jackson is going to walk through it. And I've been right there to walk with him. And that makes me very proud. But I still say there are things that you have to ask the Lord for, those that need to be open. And I have learned one thing. No matter what, I'll walk through a door that God opened for me. I don't ever have to argue about it. I never try to kick it down. He opened it. I walked through it. When you think about Bishop Jackson, my last word to you is that I have been young, but not I'm old. But I've never yep. seen the righteous to say, All right. or his seeds right. that be in prayer. All right. I tell you, do the righteous, and God will grant you the same gift that he granted me. God bless you.